Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show, hosted by a French professor who's confusing you, right? I'm always positive, and yet you see the thumbnail, you see the title of the video, No Name Is Not For Me. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm going to be reviewing her new album, Sundial, and don't worry, it's still a very positive review of a great album, an album which is very strongly sonically unified despite having many different producers, excellent rhymes, excellent raps, an amazing important voice with a different perspective. You know, a real artist at the top of her game who knows, you know, how to spit, so to speak, and how to find producers that suit her style the best. That's my take on the album. But at the same time, it's not for me. And I mean that in a couple different ways. In one way, I mean it in the sort of traditional sense then I don't mean it as like shade. I mean it as like, you know, like it's not my style. You know, it's not my style of rap album. Now, if I actually look into that, you know, realistically, I have a sort of misogynist ear when it comes to music. I have for my entire life generally disregarded music made by women and prioritized music made by men. I've only really tried to combat that in the last couple decades, uh, but still it's sort of deep down inside me. It's something that I fight against all the time. Uh, when we go a little bit deeper into that, of course, that's misogyny and that's something which I talk a lot about this channel. But there's also, you know, this term misogynoir you know, misogynoir, which re applies to misogyny directed towards black women where race and gender both play a role. That's, that's a term. I just, <laughs> it's a pretty important term, and you've probably heard of it. But, you know, people come up with this stuff. Her name is Moya Bailey. She's an associate professor, just like me, <laughs> except she's at Northwestern. Uh, I am not at Northwestern. Uh, <laughs> so uh, to say that uh, we're in the same planet is like... Uh, is not accurate, but still, she's an associate professor. Her name is Moya Bailey. She's the one who created this term. And misogynoir is interesting because uh, Alison Bechdel came up with the Bechdel test, and, and she gets named, and she's this famous person for coming up with this very important theory of sort of pop culture and feminism. And yet, somehow, the person who coined the term uh, misogynoir is very rarely named. That is, in and of itself, an act of misogynoirism. But I don't actually think that's why this album feels like it's not for me, okay? Uh, I listen and own and enjoy a lot of rap music made by black women. You know, especially Missy Elliott, who's you know, probably a top 20 musician of all time in, in my sort of brain as far as like influencing the way I think about music and what I like to listen to. I love all the artists that are out of Buffalo now, you know, Shea Noir, Love the Genius, Armani Caesar, you know, I, I enjoyed seeing Lil' Kim in concert, I own multiple Lil' Kim albums, you know, it's not like, uh, it's not like I, I can't stand music made by black women, it's probably more just your general misogyny, where I just generally don't enjoy listening, or I have a, a weird misogynist ear, a uh, bone inside my ear, which I have to overcome. Because I've definitely never, and probably... Boy, that's the next... I've never listened to an album by a white, a white female rapper. I guess that's the next... That's the next, like... Could, could I hear that and take that seriously? I don't know. The other reason that there's kind of a block to me to listen to this album... And again, whenever I talk about the me, me, me of it all, I know I'm a selfish guy. What are you going to do? You know, you're three minutes in, I'm still talking about myself. I'm not yet talking about no name. But I think it's important because I think my experience is not isolated. I think I represent a large public. This kind of prejudice against female-led rap music is, unfortunately part of the history of hip-hop culture, not just in the people who make it, but also in the people who consume it like me. So I'm not, that's why I'm focusing on me. It's a sort of a larger problem. The other problem is sort of conscious rap. And this album is has a lot of themes. It's not all about money. It's not all about popping that P word, okay? There's no... <laughs> it's, a, it's a very, at times, preachy when it's bad, but in general, just a very positive, conscious album. And... I have a conflictual relationship with positive, with conscious rap music. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. Uh, maybe, maybe we're actually headed into the fact that, oops, all along, 
it was misogynoir because a lot of the things that she's talking about are problems that black women face. And so maybe my initial hesitation to review the album ultimately does come from that. You know, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to place all these things because I've gotten a lot of comments over the last couple of weeks like, why are you not reviewing this? And, and I listened to it and I thought it was fine, but I didn't... <sighs> what was it? So that was my first take was not for me. But whenever I, I say not for me, I need to look into it more. And so then I listened to it more and I came to appreciate it more and I came to love it. And at the end of that journey, I realized it's not for me. <laughs> okay? I mean it in the second sense. Okay? It is not for. It is not intended for me. To quote her, to quote one of the best lines on this album, the casual white fan invented the voyeur. Okay? Me, as a white listener, I am not invited to this album. Now, I can listen to it. I have listened to it. I can review it. But this album is very consciously for a black audience. And so in that way, it's not for me. And not just the hostility towards, I mean, crackers, you know, term is used all over the place, and it's not that I find it offensive, but it does display a certain amount of hostility, okay? <laughs> it's obviously a hostile phrase. Um, I mean, the album's still produced by Sony, so what are you going to do? <laughs> it's, um, but the main issue about it not being for me is not just that it is hostile towards whiteness, but that it provides a view into black culture, black questions, black problems of black Americans, a sort of self-criticism, which I feel uncomfortable being in that space. I feel uncomfortable being in that space because it is a community which is often held to unfair standards. It is a community which is often cherry-picked for bad examples. And any time a black public figure criticizes black culture, white racist swoop in and say, you see, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so. You see, Bill Cosby says it, so it must be true. You see, you see. And I've studied enough of African-American discourse and academic circles and pop culture circles to know there's this certain like unease, okay? That if you're going to be critiquing the community and sort of having something that you might call accountability uh, politics, you have to keep the crackers out. Because you can't trust us. You can't. And I'm saying that as a cracker. I'm saying that as a white person. Like, you cannot trust us. Uh, me, you can trust because I'm not going to generalize. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's useful or helpful for marginalized communities to have their conflict within their group shared by the people who are oppressing them. Okay? And that goes for all marginalized communities. So... It's not for me, <laughs> okay? So that's my long caveat to say I'm still going to review this album because it's still a great piece of art. I, I am still a visitor to this world of hip-hop and rap music, and I'm still a commentator and an academic who wants to talk about it and wants to take it seriously. And frankly, if she didn't want me to review this album, she shouldn't have made it so good. Okay, so I'm going to be touching on these themes about it not being for me because I think that's an important aspect of it. And I think it's something which makes a lot of listeners angry, makes a lot of listeners feel understandably alienated. But I think listeners need to become comfortable with that and accept it. It reminds me, like in the late 90s, there was this clothing company called FUBU. And it was for us, by us. That's what it stands for. And it's an actual street fashion company owned by actual African Americans. And, uh, and it was fascinating because it was like, it, it was literally clothes which told the majority of the buying public, being, you know, the non minority, that you should not buy this clothing. Anyways, so. What about this album? Now that I'm through this kind of political stuff, maybe you've left angry comments. Maybe you appreciate my take. I do not purport to be an expert on any culture other than myself, okay? So uh, maybe I'm speaking out of school. If I'm speaking out of school, please feel free to leave long, lengthy comments correcting me. If I say something or have said something that you think is out of pocket, out of line, um, just tell me. and I'll, I'll, put, I'll pin it. I'll like it. I'll comment on it, okay? It can be a dialogue. YouTube can be a dialogue.
It's usually a monologue with a bunch of pissy garbage, but it can be a dialogue. So let's get that going. So yeah, this album is amazingly coherent. That's the thing that really strikes me. There's like producers all over the place. There's like five or six or seven or maybe even up to ten producers. I don't know how many. Uh, only one producer sort of appears multiple, multiple times, but the whole thing feels like it's all based on very tight drum lines that are funky, very jazzy, well-played bass. That's it. That is the basis of everything. We're not talking samples. We're not talking boom bap. It's jazzy, but it's not like jazz rap, you know? There's some background oohs and ahs. You know, sometimes there's a chorus that's sung in either sort of a gospel way or actually with an actual gospel chorus. There's a couple tracks that are bossa nova, but in general, it is just very coherent. The title of the album, Sundial, is one that invites you to contemplate the usage of light and darkness throughout the album. The image of a sundial is fascinating because the album is a lot about the sun. It's about light. So what is a sundial? A sundial is something that allows you to find meaning when you are in the light. It helps you like put a frame around nature. I don't know. This album is deep enough that I think there needs to be a paper written, Why is Sundial called Sundial? If you write that paper, email it to me, professorskybusiness at gmail.com. Uh, I'll share it, okay? I, I'm curious. I'm sure if you follow just the themes of sun and light, you get to the answer of why it's called Sundial. But it's part of what makes this album so intriguing. The cover is beautiful and bizarre with an unflattering picture that seems to be slightly manipulated in some way to make uh, no name seem even more... There's something about it that seems like it, she's trying to look like she's trying to look bad, if that makes sense. She's not trying, it's not the glamour shot that you normally see in an album cover. Uh, it's more of a, 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 a bizarre, unsettling image. So I'm gonna get to the album before that. If you like this video, even if you don't dislike it, but you find it interesting, you find it engaging, subscribe, um, smash the like bucket. Uh, if you want me to give you a heart on your comment, 100% guaranteed, just uh, type in the letters A-V-A-A, -A -A, awesome video as always. Uh, or just type Moya Bailey, okay? <laughs> Dear God, can we get, can this person's name be, be a, a household name? I, I have to have like all of Trump's lawyers in my head. I have to know these stupid, bloated criminals in my head and I don't immediately know the academic who termed who coined the term misogynoir, which gave voice to an entire thing that people knew existed, but she did the thing that academics can do, where by naming and describing something, we can help to actually start fight it. Like the thing that academics can do that's actually powerful and important, she did, and she's not a household name, and, and, and Rudy Giuliani and all those creeps are? I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to know Hunter Biden's name. I, I want to know Moya Bailey. Anyways, I'm off track. <laughs> um, so you can leave an AVAA or a Moya Bailey in, in the comments and I'll give you a heart. So let me give you an example of this, of this album. A Stamp is my sample song. It's called Hold Me Down, featuring Jametta Rose and Voices of Creation, like this nice chorus. And this is produced by Gaetan Judd, who has the most songs produced on here. It's got that whole, this whole album has just a general sound template. A very static, uh, like, stuttered funky beat kind of like stutter step sort of ghostly moans in the back and the bass player needs a raise whoever the bass player is she or he needs a raise because <laughs> this is just outstanding bass all the way through little tiny details and textures throughout a very uplifting catchy chorus uh, and, and what's great about this chorus and this whole album in general is it's always ambiguous you know this is not a I'm every woman uplift we can do it black women Black people, women, we can do it, we can do it. It's very ambiguous. It's very, um, it doesn't provide a lot of answers. <laughs> it provides a lot of questions. It forces you to nuance answers you thought you had to questions. And so in this case, hold me down, the, ex the expression itself is an ambiguous expression because it can mean like, you've got my back, you know, hold me down. But it can also be like, hold me down. You have the power over me. You are oppressing me. I can count on you for a favor for a certain amount, hold me down. Okay, so this appears to be a song of failed solidarity, but a, a desire for real solidarity. And this is where I'm talking about, what am I doing in this space? Okay, what am I doing in this space? White man, 
front man for the whole vision, we just see self in his image, won't be a self-critic, burn our whole village. That wasn't us, it was colonialism. So here, uh, Ben Shapiro would read this, it'd be super psyched. That's exactly what I'm saying. Colonialism isn't to blame for Africa's problems. Yes, it is, you dipshit. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that the people who live there don't have autonomy and cannot also make their problems worse and make their problems better. You know, there's a, there's a middle way between no responsibility and all responsibility. And this is why it's troublesome why you shouldn't trust me or people like me, like Ben Shapiro, to be in this space. <laughs> because... We hear that and we say, finally, someone is understanding colonialism isn't the problem. White people didn't do any of this. We're all trying to find the guy who did this, and it's not me, okay? But it's still a very important it's a very important question, right? Like the actual who how does a community, a marginalized community, strengthen itself? understanding the sources of oppression is important, but then the next step is going beyond that and overcoming the oppression and overcoming the oppressors themselves. So this is that kind of inquiry. We keep our babies fed. We don't beat in our word, our women. We good. We is Wakanda. We queen Rwanda. <sighs> so, you know, Wakanda, you know, Wakanda, Wakanda. Wakanda is not a real country. You might not know this. It's made up. Um, but Wakanda is a very complicated... It does not get enough respect as an idea in our culture as this desire for a happy, well-adjusted, uh, resource-rich, unpillaged African country. Okay, this, the Afrofuturism, the uh, science fiction of it all, this great ideal, and then Queen Rwanda, Rwanda, which is an example of a country which was horribly colonized and even worse decolonized that led to black people of different sizes and shapes and tribes murdering each other in the thousands, okay? So this is that, that question. This is that, that debate that's going on. And you have to know a little bit of history to know that, to know that the reality is Rwanda and not Wakanda. And the question is, could the reality have been Wakanda? First black president, he the one who bombed us. So talking about Obama's, uh, Obama's role in drones, making mm, rich, black billionaire, legit, slave market deficit, rise up, rise up. So there, you, you, you get it? So like it's not for me in the sort of soundscape of it all. I like it, but it's, you know, I prefer a little bit grimier rap music, a little bit harder rap music. But still, it's very good, very well made. And then it's not for me because it's this whole conversation about black responsibility for black problems, which shouldn't be. Beautiful outro, Jametta Rose like sings lead over this gospel. The production here really is outstanding. This bass is just going wild and the drums cut out at the end. Okay, I'm going to go through the rest of the album a little bit quicker here. This is my mug. It's cool. It's the only piece of merch I have left. If you get one, hand wash it. If you put it in the dishwasher, it fades. It fades like the memory of summer in sixth grade. I don't know what I did then. Black Mirror is the first track on the album, produced by Daoud. Tinkling sounds sort of announced. It has the feeling that this is going to be an important album, and it is. Some synthesizers behind. This is the first of the kind of bossa nova beats, which is cool. We don't hear a lot of rapping to bossa nova beats. Now all you hear is either reggaeton or trap, so it's interesting here. Kind of the thesis. This first track is probably why I didn't review this album, is because this opening is sort of all the stuff that I was afraid the whole album would be, but the album is not. Like, the whole beginning is like, I am this and I am that. She's a shadow walker, moon stalker, black author, librarian, contrarian. They say we dead, we're not, I believe, my sister, we're positive, all this kind of stuff, which is not bad stuff. But I sometimes find the sort of uplifting rap music of that stuff style repetitive and uh, pandering but that it's not the album <laughs> it, that's just like the first half of the first verse and then she nuances it immediately you know we smoke in positivity like dust trust angels never effed with us shadow box till sundown till sundown lynch down you know, so all of a sudden we have like the sundial and the image of sun and then a sundown town is a town where you know, uh, African-Americans were expected not to be uh, or else running 
uh, running the risk of being lynched in the South, but also shadow boxing in the sun is like kind of shadow boxing is a powerful image, all these things all together. You know, my initial dismissal was, was bull pizzle. No, I'm not going to drink more coffee. I don't deserve coffee after that joke. My initial dismissal was bull pizzle. It may actually end up being uh, the greatest thing I've ever said. She refers to herself as a socialism sister. Uh, I am interested. This album does a fair amount of like lefty, left, left, left stuff, such as promoting socialism, uh, interesting um, sort of against formal, strict uh, gender concepts, uh, very fluid sexuality. Interesting there. It leads directly into Hold Me Down, which I've already discussed. Then we get to Balloons, produced by Saba and Ben Narti. Uh, probably the most interesting beat so far on the album. Simple piano with a hard shuffling beat. It's a great bed for her voice. Real uh, awareness here. You know, she's rapping about how the best way to sell rap albums is to talk about your trauma. You know, why everybody love a good, sad song, a dark album like Tell Me That Your Homie Dead, Your Mama Dead. This sense that there isn't really space for black joy in black music that the white voyeuristic audience of people such as like as myself and the Iraq that we just want that and so she says she's just another artist selling trauma to her fan base and this is something which is definitely coming up a lot because the more that rap music is used as a way to process trauma the better <laughs> okay that's positive that's a positive thing that oppressed people across the world this isn't just a question of black americans this is oppressed people across the world use the genre of rap to express their trauma and to cope with their trauma this is a positive thing the negative thing sony records knows that sells get that money talk about that trauma and all of a sudden you're there then we get j electronica's verse I own Jay Electronica's album. I think Jay Electronica is a good a good rapper. When I, but this is so cringy. His verse is terrible. It listen. Whenever I call him anti-Semitic, people immediately jump on and say you can't be black and anti-Semitic. Fine, anti-Jewish. Okay. Can I, can I say that? Can I say that? You're already so mad. You're typing. I don't care. I say it all the time. <laughs> the people who benefit from anti-Jewishness are white devils, okay? They're the people who benefit from it. Nobody else, okay? White devils like me are the problem, okay? White supremacy is the problem, okay? So there's just all this coded, dog whistly anti-Jewish stuff, which is just, it's the least interesting thing about him. Now, I always have to, to caveat it that as a member of Nation of Islam, Nation of Islam, is a complex group which i personally believe has done a lot of good probably more good than bad but the bad thing that they do is promote anti-jewishness which is a very negative thing so this verse is sort of all the bad stuff you know if anybody asks him tell tell him farrakhan sent me all right all right i mean all right <laughs> farrakhan sent you but you're more interesting than farrakhan and you're probably more honest I think he takes a shot at Zelensky. It's all a hoax, quite a simple, a joke like Zelensky. I don't know if this is or if this is just because Zelensky is Jewish or whatever, but I mean, being like pro-Russia, oh, I mean, uh, is, that, is that a thing now? Is, it, is that a thing? Is Farrakhan pro-Russia and anti-Ukraine? I don't know. And it talks about the Armageddon. If you ain't fighting, I mean, you're either dead or a prisoner. All right. Again, I... I I go over to my album collection right now, okay? I support Jay Electronic as an artist. But yeesh, yeesh, this is his worst. Speaking of worst, we get to the next song, Boom Boom. Another produced by Gaetan Judd, but this is another bossa nova beat, and, and, and this is kind of a, a love-hate song, love-hate song for me. Very strong vocals, flows forward, but then gets really sexual. And if you know one thing about Professor Sky's record review, I don't like really sexual songs. Okay? I don't want to hear a guy talking about skeet skeet. I don't want to hear a woman talking about mop it up. I don't want to hear any of it. Okay, I just, I don't enjoy it. Okay, graphic descriptions of sex acts. It's just, it's not my, it's not my jam, baby. But 
So ticky ticky boom boom, a lagoon goon, kissing a poom poom, pussy tastes like food food. Pussy never been foo foo, cuckoo bad timing, clock minute, mm, moisturize his lining. I, I get it. I'm really in Ben Ben Shapiro territory here. <laughs> P word never been foo foo. Uh, but I'm going to nuance this and go a little bit further and say even though I don't like it, it's very well done. It is actually kind of sensual, which is nice. It's not crass. It's actually kind of sensual. And she refers to herself as being a freak for real. And that's where we're reminded, oh, right, any time a woman talks graphically about sex, it is an act of revolution. It is because women are expected not to talk about sex. They are expected not to have agency in sexual interactions. They are expected not to have their own opinions. They are expected to be vessels, not actors. So even though it's not my thing, even though I skipped this song... It is actually an important song. It is actually an act of revolution like the rest of the album. I just... Moisturize his lining is a term I just don't need to hear anymore. Never been fufu. How's my Ben Shapiro impersonation? I'm trying to get the eyebrows right. That's the, that's the hardest part. W.E.B. Stay with the boys. I faded the noise. I echo inf infinity joy. Just an interesting uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, reference. I don't quite get it if she's just being funny here. Uh, but again, this concept of joy, you know, the concept of black joy is one that people work on a lot and talk about the importance about how so often the African-American experience is put in the context of suffering and misery and that joy itself is an act of revolution. Black joy is an act of revolution and music is a pathway to that. And so is sex. So there you go. Then we get to probably the high point. Probably my favorite track on the album. Potentially the interlude produced by Wesley Singerman and Yousef Dates. Hard drums, energize. The bass drum is doing all this cool energizing staccato stuff. Um, more ooze in the back. But then the whole concept here. I just love this. I love this perhaps because it's more universal. This doesn't feel like this is... Uh, uh, this feels like this is a universal problem, not a problem of women, not a problem of black people, not a problem of black women, not a problem of the African diaspora. Uh, it's a universal problem. People say they love you, but they really love potential, not the person that's in front of them, but the person you'll grow into. That's great, you know, because No Name is an artist who I don't know very well. I've, I've reviewed a couple songs that she's appeared on, and she was on, I guess, Acid Rap with Chance the Rapper, and she she was a potential, and everyone really loved the potential of her, but then she was not what they expected her to be, so she didn't become the superstar that she probably should be, and maybe she will be with this album. Who knows? If you were just a little more pretty, you wrote a little bit like Kenny, you'd have a life worth living. You'd be a happy one. This idea... That when you're only prized for your potential, not for what you are, you're constantly in a state of, of unhappiness and a lack of fulfillment. Next song is called Namesake. Wait, why did I put in my notes that this is my favorite track? <laughs> okay, you know what? I said this wasn't for me, that, that the style wasn't. I listened to it like four times in a row this morning while playing with my baby in the baby pit. It's like a little pit. I had, we got a little Grover tour. Hi! you know playing with Grover it's cool it's very fun stuff um, and the more I listened to it the more I liked it so I guess it's the third time I've said favorite track very bass led drums gentle synth behind starts off with a sort of casually bisexual message goes more into never needing a man and then gets into this final verse and this final ending which I just said the whole potential and the whole thing but if No Name could release an album like the last verse of this song Ooh, <laughs> it's unbelievable. Maintain a good life. We could fry plantain. Same day airstrikes fly, fly, strike down on Irene. I ran into the house with a blunt in my hand. Let's smoke. I don't want to see death no more. Let's fight. They got the devil hiding in plain sight. That's you. That's me. The whole world's culpable. Why complacency float the boat the most? I don't really get it. Y'all aren't really with it. All that eat the rich, tack the rich. You ain't really about that shit, bitch. You want some money? You can say that. You deserve payback because it took everything. Let's get that and take it to the hood, though. Share with the community. Be soldiers in plain clothes. Everybody got their role. Don't be an op. Everybody got their role. I'm a play mine like Scooby Doo in a haunted house. I see the ghosts they're talking about. I see the signs. Like, this is what I'm talking about. Like, she's like talking about all these things, talking about how people don't really want to tax the rich, talking about how most people pretend to be socialists or actually just looking for more money themselves so they can abandon the movement, all that kind of stuff. And then she like throws in this kind of like Scooby Doo line, you know, so she's mixed like that throws a different kind of like rhythm in these whole rhymes and it takes it to this kind of like funny area, right? Read in between the lines at the crime scene. I ain't effing with the NFL or Jay-Z. Propaganda for the military complex. 
Same gun that shot Little Terry out west. Same gun that shot Samir in the West Bank. They all think the Super Bowl is the best thing. So then she goes on this whole rant about how all these black artists are supporting the Super Bowl by performing at the Super Bowl. Go Jay-Z, go. Go Rihanna, go. Go Beyonce, go. Go Kendrick, go. And talking about how it is just propaganda for the military. Which it is. You know? She's, again, this is that conversation that's happening with... You're just going to have to deal with it. They're mowing lawns outside, so you're just gonna have to deal with it. I have to deal with it. Tell me in the comments if it's okay. <laughs> or tell me in the comments if it's not. Um, you know, like, the idea of the Super Bowl as being a way of supporting American military hegemony, supporting racism, supporting the police, it is very clear and it's there. I'll never forget when I saw a stealth bomber. Uh, it was July 4th, like 2002. And I remember seeing a stealth bomber flew over overhead in Boston and everyone went, wow, cool. And I swear to God, I just cried. And I was like 20 years old. I was like 21 or 22, 20, whatever, however old I was. And I just cried. And I couldn't figure out why, but I realized, you know, this is a death machine. Like most people who see this, that is the last thing they see. And we just sit there and we watch these jets fly and we clap for these death machines. Every time you see a fly by, by a jet, understand that that thing was created to murder children. That's what it was made for. Anyways. Yeah, now I'm married to somebody who was bombed by the United States government in 1999. You know? <laughs> Somebody who has heard jets flying over her city and heard the bombs fall, and I'm supposed to sit there and clap because, because of what? So, it's great stuff. And then she calls herself to task for playing at Coachella. And it's very cool, very kind of old school verse. It's great. And we get to Beauty Supply, produced by Emil. This song reminds me a lot of the track Kiosk by Lupe Fiasco in a very positive way. It's a great song. It has that same kind of like lightness and depth to it uh, and a great kind of catchy chorus. And this, talk about not for me. This is all about feminism and black beauty standards and black businesses that cater to white European standards. It's a, it's a great song. If I if I were a teacher, if I were uh, at Northwestern and able to teach a class um, alongside uh, Moya Bailey, and I was told, Sky, you have to teach a class about uh, beauty about black beauty standards, I'd say first of all, why are you having me do this? Moya Bailey's right there, but fine, may maybe she's uh, got the flu. If I had to take like one object to show them, I'd show them this song, because this goes through the whole thing about the problems of the beauty standard and about how black businesses profit off of that, that beauty standard, okay? So this is not for me. This is not for me to sit around and pontificate about well, black women want to have European hair and that uh, prevents them from a... Oh, Jesus Christ, you don't want to hear me talking about it, but I'm happy to hear about it. I idolize a white B-word while I rock a toupee, I cosplay a new identity, same enemy, me, when I believe I'm prettier with my weave, when I could be see the forest behind the trees, I'll be free, I'll be free. Beautiful song, very deep. It does give me the scent, like... I remember when I saw that documentary on black hair, and uh, I just didn't know. I just I didn't know. I, I like I, I literally went from not knowing that it was a thing at all to understanding it a little bit, which for a documentary is an amazing success. And sort of since then, I feel like there's been a lot of great work and a lot of great discourse around this. Next track is called Toxic, which opens up with a quote from the movie Boomerang. I was a white kid in the 80s, which means I love Eddie Murphy. Oh, I loved Eddie Murphy. I love, I want the, the knife. I love trading places. I love, well, I rented Delirious and started watching it with my parents that made me turn it off Im immediately. But I loved Eddie Murphy. He was the funniest person in the world. And I remember when the movie Boomerang came out and I didn't watch it. You know why? It wasn't for me. Okay, I now understand there's a whole raft of movies that were made for a black audience to relate to a black audience that even though they starred crossover stars like Eddie Murphy, I was not about to watch that. I understood on some level that like 
I will not enjoy this movie. Which is a problem with me, right? Like, I should watch that movie. It's a very important movie. FT Signifier's done a lot of great work on sort of movies about black love and the way they're represented. Uh, and it's just a whole raft of movies that I've never seen before because of this weird kind of... Uh, sort of racism, but it's more like willful ignorance of this part of the human experience. Which is racist. Anyways, the movie Boomerang is interesting because it's about Eddie Murphy, who's a womanizer, who has a woman played by Robin Givens who treats him the way that he treats women. And then he sort of like finds a Halle Berry who plays his character who's like nice to him and, and he's like always pining for this woman who's just sort of mistreating him. And it's an interesting theme because this whole movie itself, this whole song, is basically from the perspective of Angela, from the perspective of Halle Berry's character. Well, I guess Halle Berry was supposed to be the unattractive one in this movie. I don't know how that, I don't know how that works out, but anyways, I, I guess it was one of her earlier roles uh, before she was established as, you know, sexiest woman alive or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so it's very interesting in that way, that, that it's from this perspective. Uh, she says, I can do bad, bad all by my lonely. I don't think that's a reference to Bismarcky, but he has a beautiful song. I could do bad by myself. I don't need your help to starve to death. I could do it alone. <laughs> I don't know if it's a reference to that, but I will always quote Bismarcky when I can. Uh, but it's, it's, and it, I like it because she, also, she always takes responsibility. She's a very interesting uh, person in that way where she's never just blaming other people. Really, it was me. You see, I gave my energy to he. She's taking responsibility for how she does it. In some ways, it's kind of like a good companion piece to We Cry Together by Kendrick Lamar because it's sort of about this fight. You know, good pussy for love. I'm his little secret under the rug. I can almost be wifey, but I ain't light skin enough. Quiet is kept. Your dick is mid. Quiet is kept. I don't want your kid. She can have him. But what's nice is that the stakes are kind of lower. Like, this feels like this is about a bad relationship, but this doesn't feel like this is, like, abuse and gnashing of teeth. This feels like just sort of standard human lack of compatibility. Afrofuturism, produced by Nascent. Again, very tight, staggered beat, ghost signs behind. Um, not too much to say about this, but more sort of in this theme of questioning the uh, questioning questions of global blackness. Moving on to the next song, Gospel. It's called Gospel, produced by Gaitan Judd again. And it's called Gospel uh, because it does have a whole gospel chorus. Um, but it's in, it's a question, you know. It's all it's sort of questioning the role of hope and I think religion in these kind of fights for equality and, and fair treatment. If we put up a fight, everything will just be fine. That's the chorus. It, does that sound like a very uplifting chorus? If we put up a fight, everything will be fine. No, it's not because it doesn't say if we win a fight. It says if we put up a fight, everything will be just fine. That there's a question mark there. Will we be fine? We don't know. But it's a catchy awesome chorus, great little piano, very, very moving. Uh, she has a whole verse about, you know, this is no de Haiti, Mozambique, Martinique, Trinidad. And then we get Silk Money's verse. And this is the most militant verse on here. Uh, Traded in our fears of a white god in exchange for eternal pride. This Kalashnikov kills crackers, banana mags, send his ass back to the Caucasus Mountains. Um, you know, it's, I mean, whatever, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's always a question of power, right? Um, it's, a, it's a little much. <laughs> I don't know. It's a little much, I think. But maybe that's the point, you know? I, here I am, a white guy, saying, I don't like this fellow saying he's going to kill me. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's a little bit much. Do you understand what I'm saying? But that doesn't matter because Woods, Billy Woods gets a verse on here. And he does everything that this album does, but he does it with a subtlety. Uh, I guess we could call it a Woodsian subtlety. <laughs> it requires a level of thought. He sets the entire verse from the stadium in the capital of Rhodesia, Salisbury, which would become Harare, the capital of Zimbabwe, which was declared, you know, the freedom... Uh, of Zimbabwe was declared April 18th, 1980, and that's where he situates this verse, where he presumably was with his father, who served in the Revolutionary Council, and he puts himself on his father's shoulders, and you are there with him, and you see Mugabe, wide rim glasses, makes reference to that, makes reference to his dad having a, a little red book, because it was partly a Maoist revolution, talks about comrades, 
but then there's this hanging question of what happens next because the future of Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe is a very complicated place depending on how you read the history. It's either a complete and total failed example of reverse racism with land back programs or it is one of the more successful liberation movements. I am <clears throat> not qualified even close to give you an answer on how successful of a revolution uh, was the Zimbabwe revolution in terms of increasing the happiness of the majority of the people who live in that country, I will tell you that there's no easy answer. So most, there's a lot of kind of colonialist histories that sort of use Zimbabwe as an example of the worst thing you can do, which in that case, the worst thing you can do is inconvenience uh, white people, right? Which arguably is not actually the worst thing you can do. But the question is, what happens next? And so he puts you in this place. Women ululating, men drunk, song spirits, dueling drums. They callous thumbs of Mambira players, the ride home at dusk, faring students and strangers, feeling, feeling like we won, roadblocks manned by mere boys, wide smiles, and long black guns. So what happens next? He leaves us here after this revolution feeling like we won, but maybe we didn't win, meaning the people didn't win, meaning the colonized, not win against the colonizers, roadblocks with child soldiers, smiling wide with guns. This is gonna be part of the problem that is going to lead to a tense and suboptimal situation for Zimbabwe in the post-revolutionary era. And he's providing it for us without providing answers, without saying definitively how we're supposed to feel. I know how I feel about the damn lawnmower. It's okay. Dude's out there who's got a, got a butt that's in out of his head, out of his mouth. Oblivion's the next track, uh, produced by Berg, featuring Common and Ioni. I feel like I've already heard this beat on the album, but that's sort of a, a testament to how strong the album is in terms of its cohesion, bass, tight drum line, ooze ahs in the back. The chorus is maybe the best production on the album with Iona singing here and just there's something about the way this chorus is produced that's very satisfying. I sort of feel like if the raps at the end of Namesake could meet the chorus of this song and you had that level of excellence the, all the way through the album, that the album would just be sort of on that next kind of masterpiece level as opposed to being very, very good. Uh, there's more comedy in this song, which I like. I'm that bitch, you sound like cat piss on popcorn. Eat that popcorn. <laughs> It's cat piss on popcorn. Popcorn already kind of smells like cat piss. You ever notice that? Boom, ba -doo, boop, 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 boop. What's the deal with popcorn? Did a cat piss on the popcorn? Point is, it's kind of a funny line. Uh, the whole, it's all about oblivion and the world blowing up and things not mattering. It's kind of a weird pessimistic ending. Common has like the most common lyric ever. My metaphysics ain't for the metaverse. It's red alerts. I touch where the ghetto hurts. Beautiful line, very well delivered. So there you go, there's my review of No Name. It's not for me, but I'm happy to, to have listened to it. I'm happy to have thought it. Thank you to those who have been sort of angrily posting, how come you haven't reviewed No Name? Um, my auditors, my viewers do keep me honest, you know? I imagine I'm gonna get some interesting comments from people about how I said some stuff that they don't like, and that's totally cool. Let's make this a dialogue. These are my Patreons, patreon.com backslash Professor Scott. They help me buy music. And stuff. Okay, until next time, there's the camera.